What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Invested Hockey Podcast. Today is December 12, 2023. I am Anthony Santini, joined here with Eric Wilson. You thought I was going to... I tricked you. But today we're going to be talking hockey and everything that happened in the past week, as per usual. But with a little bit of a twist today. But congratulations to Eric Wilson. He did the impossible he, with an impeccable, amazing... He went 7-for-7 seven seven on his predictions Bang, last week. Bang. For the first time ever, Eric Wilson is a sharp. Well, honestly, it's an honor. Um, I'm glad that you could witness it. I'm glad that it finally happened, especially after uh, the way we started these podcasts the last couple of weeks. Um, there was a few where I went, you know, three for seven, and obviously you weren't too happy. Your, your voice in those podcasts weren't too uh, happy at the start, but I went seven for seven. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed with myself, and it all started with uh, that first game, which was the Sens beating the New York Rangers. So, Yeah, and you took a couple underdogs. Like, I wasn't too surprised that – I mean, I don't know. It's tough to say that I knew you were going to go 7-for-7, seven seven, but looking at some of the teams you pick, like Buffalo over Boston, Sens over New York Rangers, I was – I don't know. I, I was a little bit surprised by those. But just to kind of regroup and look back on what we're talking about, Eric went 7-for-7. Seven seven. He picked – Sevens sends over the Rangers, the Lightning over the Penguins, Sabres over the Bruins, Oilers over the Wild, Leafs over the Predators, Kings over the San Jose Sharks. Not Kings, sorry, Vegas. Or Vegas Knights over the San Jose Sharks and the Colorado Avalanche versus the Calgary Flames last night who came back down, I believe, 5-3 to three to win 6-5 and Rantanen, who got me my Tim's picks and one step closer to my... Hopefully seven days of free coffee, but not the story. The story is you hitting seven for seven. Congratulations. We will continue in the new year to try this again, and hopefully you can do it. Exactly. I hope I can definitely have maybe one, maybe two more. I, obviously, going for seven, seven for seven is not easy, but um, it felt like a bit of a roller coaster just because um, we, I don't know, as a Bruins fan, I didn't want the Sabres to win that game, but um, it just so happened. I feel like once we got the three games past that, I was like, okay, I can see it happening. Um I think that the one we knew, we knew Vegas was going to beat the San Jose Sharks, yeah, but for them yeah. to beat them in a shootout and then for Colorado, it was close. It, like, it wasn't like it was just easy wins 4-1, but like, I think the one game that um, Edmonton had was 4-1 over Minnesota. Like, that was a game where I was like, okay, it's nice to see Edmonton. Yeah, uh, just kind of like walk in, take the game, and that's yeah. it. Yeah, but nothing beats like a hockey game where it's like Toronto Nashville, you just watch the game and it's a... a a good hockey game so yeah that was good hockey to watch we watched that game matthews with a goal he scored last night again for or matthews had two goals that game against nashville i'm pretty sure i think right? he did yeah he had two he had another goal last night against the islanders we'll talk a little bit more about him in our later segment um but like you said with san jose sharks you weren't too surprised with vegas taking them on and beating them although they did beat them all the way in a shootout san jose's been playing pretty good this year yeah, yeah. Like, honestly, they've been playing some good hockey. Granlin's been playing good. Yeah, honestly, like I, they have a lot of they have a weird system because I don't see you don't see the chemistry when you look at their lineup. You don't see like Carlson and they're there again. You see a guy like Vlasic who like you don't know what he brings in the locker room. You don't know how he he motivates the team. I think it's a guy like him who, who's kind of bringing that core together. Yeah, because he's a little bit of an older player, which is okay to have on a team that can be struggling because you do need that veteran presence, right? The biggest thing that. I can think comes from a team like this having success is remember at the beginning of the season where any team would just walk in and just cake them like yeah. just absolutely like they were losing what 10-1 9-1 like mm -hmm. they lost like back-to-back -back games by like eight plus margins or something like that yeah I think it's just like the sheer embarrassment I guess of coming to the rink losing a game like that which has now motivated them and especially some of the young players are really starting to produce for a team that kind of struggled to start off the year yeah that makes me think of thomas hurdle because he had that interview with the reporter where he, he looked exhausted and he looked embarrassed and i think that the reporter said to him like what's going on there in the locker room after that 10-1 loss and he he didn't have anything to say but um i think he's been hot hot recently i think he has five points in his last four games something like that um if we can pull that up yeah well, we'll double if you want to double check that but definitely with thomas hurdle um, we were kind of talking, I think it was three podcasts ago, when it was all this San Jose craze with how bad they've been. We were chatting about should he request a trade because he could be a top two-line center in the NHL on almost any team. I mean, he would produce on, I think, arguably any team you put him on. And 
to say like all right let's go play like three four more years on a team that's straight up rebuilding it's tough to do for him yeah i i mean i just have to point this out here i was i was wrong with this uh i think i said four points in his last five games but um yeah uh, last night against vegas he had uh one assist and then the game before that he had two goals game before that he had three goals Hmm. and then he had apple apple so right now it looks like he has eight points in his last five games so i i definitely was wrong by saying four in his last five or something like that um so good for hurdle there um leading the way yeah that's pretty good because he's on a contract eight million for eight years so he's on an eight by eight it's not that bad for a team that has a lot of cap room and you know they have a lot to look forward to in the next coming years but for us we have a little bit to look forward to and the 2024 world juniors are just around the corner a couple days away 14 days away two weeks to be exact and eric what are you looking forward to because you have not stopped talking about it all week oh i know honestly like i didn't even get a chance to ask you about your uh, weekend but um i was able to finish up my exams and once those were done i pretty much just started looking forward to these world juniors so 14 days coming up um i think i'm just so excited because i don't I'm not familiar with a lot of the guys that are playing this year. So it's like the guys that I do know, they, they stand out. The guys that we followed uh, in the draft last year, we were together for that draft in the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it feels more meaningful when you only know a few players on each team. And then, uh, you know, it's going to be boxing. Day. You're going to see a guy score two goals. And you're like, oh, who's this? Yeah, who is like, this guy? Right? It's going to be great. Um, there's so much to talk about when we mention the World Juniors, but – as Canadians, um, we're looking at Macklin Celebrini, who's supposed to go first overall next draft. Um, I think that's where the hype is. Um, I mean, on a bit of a more negative note, um, we are going to get to who we think maybe is going to win the tournament, but I'll say it right now. Um, I'm worried about Team Canada, and I think Team Canada looks weak this year. Yeah, I definitely agree. For me, this is probably the weakest Canadian team that I've seen put out in the world juniors and it kind of goes to show not only skill wise but their youth and like you mentioned before there's a lot of new faces and it's almost a time where you don't really know what type of players at least for us when we're going to watch the games like I haven't watched a lot of Celebrini I've heard he's great I've watched a couple of his Boston games but what like little clips I don't really know the type of players he is but when you're missing players like Stankoven, Othman, Shane Wright, Bedard, Fantilli, Zellweger, Brant Clark. Like, they had some really big names that were playing big minutes and were a massive contribution to their gold medal last year. So I'm a little bit worried for this Team Canada team. And it makes me think of a guy like Kirby Doc. When he got hurt, we were still really optimistic for Team Canada. I think that was the year they had uh, Makar in the World Juniors, correct? Like, they they had talent there, and it's not like this year we're looking at – a guy like Shane Wright who's returning unfortunately he's not and it's just it's uh I think it's just more question marks right last year we were uh very excited it was like okay this team is nuts um we didn't even know if Bedard was going to lead that team we we thought maybe Shane Wright could step it up and uh, be that number one guy but obviously um it ended up being Bedard but yeah I think there's a lot of question marks about Canada um there's other teams uh, including Team USA where we mentioned we're Canadian and it's really hard to watch these guys play because we don't, we don't get these college games. We don't get these NCAA games. Um, So it's almost like you hear about these guys. um, We were talking about the sharks a few minutes ago. You hear about Will Smith. You see some draft highlights a couple months ago in the summer, but we haven't watched Will Smith play at all. We just, we just hear that he's, you know, that fourth overall or whatever third overall pick. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I definitely agree with the young guys. It can be tough because you haven't seen their full development, and it's really hard to gauge how well they are developing, how well they were when they were drafted, before they were drafted, afterwards. So for me, a player like you mentioned, Will Smith, Celebrini, it is tough. We're going to get a really good look at what these players look like, you know, on the quote-unquote big stage because this, for some players, is the biggest stage that they'll ever play on. Right? Like you're looking at some players a couple of years ago, like Liam Foodie, who was great for Team Canada when he was in, I think, the 2021, um, I think it was 2021, yeah. Team Canada World Junior Team. And he looked pretty good. He was playing that second line, but he didn't really pan out too well. We've seen he was dropped uh, just last week on waivers. He cleared waivers. But yeah, this is one of the biggest stages for uh, some of these players. And hopefully they can. Uh, act accordingly yeah yeah just to finish that off um the one guy i was thinking of who was kind of recalled from the nhl for this tournament was tristan leno i'm sure you've heard the name he's played about 20 games for the ducks so far and 
um, it makes you, you again reflect on the last few years, right? We had we had Owen Zellweger last year with Team Canada, and it was like a bit of that insurance where you're like, okay, this guy is doing well in the WHL. Um, he's a great skater, got great hands, so you know we're pretty safe. We don't have a Kale McCarr right here, but we have we have Owen Zellweger, and now it's like, okay, we have Tristan Leno. It, it seems like a bit of a, a downgrade in my eyes. I think he's going to be that number one defenseman um, for Team Canada. You can correct me if there's maybe someone else, but um, I think that's like I was saying, the question marks, it's just like we don't know and they don't do a great job of releasing the best information, right, about like rosters and stuff. We, we still don't really know exactly who's like, well, what those lines are going to look like. I know it's early, but I think they're, they're playing those uh, preliminary games today, um, like we were talking about. Well, yeah, like you said, it is tough because they don't release a lot of information and I, I don't discredit that to some of the networks or anything like that that are releasing the information, but rather... I think just the teams themselves don't know because these players are so young that, you know, player A can practice great on Monday, great on Tuesday, and then the rest of the week they're just brutal on the power play. And that's how fast things can shift with the World Juniors because you're looking at the start of a tournament, a player playing on that first line, and then out of nowhere, oop, fourth line, drop. They're not playing well, and then they're struggling down there. So it's a good time for a player to definitely climb up the ranks with their draft stocks and at the same time, climb down right yeah it's it's a really good question i mean um i i although you know i think that's a bit of like the the defensive aspect there but i'm i would love to see more of like the non uh north america piece like we don't see enough about team finland or team sweden why are we seeing more info on team canada and more info on team usa is that just because the nhl is only covering the north american piece or like um i assume that's the reason but um you know when i see that Team Finland doesn't have like a projected roster yet. It's like, come on, like I'm, I'm excited for these World Juniors. Let's get her going here, you know. Yeah, I don't know why they don't. I, I don't know if there's exactly a reason why they don't release um, this information to us. I mean, I mean us as in us from Canada over here. But I don't know. I I just keep coming back to that comment of I don't think the teams actually know themselves what's going on and who's going to be that player, who they're taking because I don't think roster cuts are done just yet. Yeah, it's a really good point, honestly. Like, we still have 14 days. It's not like we have a week. Um, a lot can change in the next seven days, call it, and then uh, we'll look forward to Boxing Day. Yeah, a lot can change in seven days, but what can't change, seven months from now, we will have the NHL draft just about that time. And teams will be looking at Celebrini, a player that's going to be playing in this World Juniors, and, you know, they're going to say, do we want to start a franchise with this guy? Is he going to be our franchise player? And when you do have that first overall pick, that's the first question that's going to come to your mind, no doubt. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing there, just to go back to that World Juniors topic, is he's playing, and then we have Cole Eisenman, who's not playing. He wasn't selected for the USA camp. So it's almost like Eisenman's going to stand a little more now. Maybe there's a little less pressure on his shoulders just because he's the only um, – how old would he be? An 06? Probably 06. He's probably 16. Yeah, I believe he would be the only – one of the only 06s in the tournament. Um and when you talk about talent there, we looked at the uh, draft class and guys who might not be in this tournament. Um, who is the guy that stands out to you upcoming in this draft? Yeah, a player for me that definitely stands out is Denver Barkey. So I actually watched a couple of his games. I'm not too, too familiar with his game playing with the, the London Knights, but when he was the captain of, I believe, the U-17 in the Holinka Gretzky playing for Team Canada, Watching a couple of his games that weekend, he was a leader on the team. He scored a couple crucial goals, and he played well. He was also playing with um, Olivier Bonk and Easton Cowan, I believe, on the London Junior Knights. So he does know how to play with talented players. And although he might not be in that top three conversation with the upcoming draft, I think grabbing him anywhere in that top ten can add that offensive jolt to almost any struggling team right now in the NHL. Yeah, good take from you there. Honestly, I'm going to uh, turn that over to a defensive uh, player I was looking into, Zane Perrick. Um, he's from Ontario. Um, he's not going to be playing in the World Juniors, but he's lighting it up in the OHL this year. He has more points than he did all of last year. So um, uh, for the Saginaw Spirit, he actually won Player of the Month, I think a month ago for November. Uh, and right now he's got 11 goals, 29 apples in 27 games. So 40 points, 27 games. As a defenseman, having 11 goals already is pretty nuts. Oh, yeah. um, I think we're seeing a very high-scoring OHL. I don't know if you agree, but like we have guys right now, we have someone with 31 goals in 31 games, which is absolutely nuts. Really? Like, so it's almost like 
I don't think that a guy like Zane Parrick is getting credited for what he's doing. I mean, again, we I know we're seeing so many high-scoring games, but um, I think this is a guy who could go in the top 10, but maybe more of a 10 to 15 guy just because he, he's a defenseman. Um, I think he's 17 right now, so it's like mm-hmm. you never know what happens. But uh, he, he's six foot. He's got uh, he's got the weight. He's got the size. But who knows, right? Yeah, who knows? And definitely it, it all comes down to when it comes to the NHL draft. Once you pass that top five pick, I think it's just team need. And whatever a team thinks they will need, they will go and get because that's essentially what the draft is made for. You need to fill those gaps and make the right selections. So when players are available, you know, even though – if player A is not available, player B may be a backup. I don't want to call players a backup, but you need to have backup options once they start missing off the board. And like you said, any defenseman, especially, I believe you said, what, six foot? Yeah, he's six foot, yeah. Any six foot tall defenseman, any team would like on the NHL. And it's going to be very interesting looking forward at that draft when it comes next summer. But a team right now that is struggling and will be looking to fill some gaps now that there are injuries is the Detroit Red Wings. And I know you want to do a little bit of injury talk, but Larkin, Comfort, and Clem Cawson of the Edmonton, of the previous Edmonton Oiler player have all been placed on the injury reserve. Yeah, it's a little interesting because the last couple of podcasts we've been able to talk about different teams, different injuries, but um, we've seen we've seen a bit of a standstill. Now it's like, oh, these three guys are on the IR for Detroit. Um, Detroit's been through... A lot this season, mostly good. We saw Debrinket start out hot. We've seen the addition of Patrick Kane, which we discussed um, on episode eight, if you want to check that out. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, okay, Larkin, their number one center, who's been there for the longest, I think, as a Red Wing, is on the IR. Definitely tough for them. Um, We talked about how we're already one-third into the season and how that Atlantic division is just going to get tougher and tougher. Um, I'm I'm a little worried there for the Red Wings. I think uh, a guy like JT Comfer missing him is going to be huge. Um, Clem Cost in a depth piece. It's just that you need every win possible if you're the Red Wings. I think a guy like Vili Husso is going to get a little burnt out uh, with how he's with the, the amount of games he's starting. I don't think you're going to be able to rely on um, Alex Lyon as your backup. I, I I don't know what to say about that, but I mean I I would actually contradict that statement. I think that both both goalies have been great this year. Although Husso doesn't really look like an absolute starting starter in the NHL. Like he doesn't look like a Hollabuck, a Bobrovsky. He doesn't look like a like an Allmark, but he's doing his job. Alex Lyon in that backup position has come in and won games for this team. But for me right now, it, this can go both ways. Like the Detroit Red Wings started off hot. I didn't think they were going to be a good NHL hockey team, but it looks like now struggling, missing their captain for who knows how long. They have the new piece of Patrick Kane coming in. I don't know if they're going to be able to survive in that Atlantic division. Like, there's a lot of good teams, and this could go south very fast. I don't think this is what Patrick Kane is looking for. I think he wants to come into a team where, obviously, I mean, nothing's perfect, but you come into a team, you kind of slide into a role, you find a role that kind of works, that's already been working for them, evidently. But with a couple injuries, Patrick Kane's going to kind of look – like that star player pretty quickly oh yeah Detroit Red Wings or they're gonna need him to be yeah you can't step in slowly if you're Patty Kane you really gotta score some goals have a nice uh I don't know somehow get that power play going without Larkin um the room the problem there is there's some room for drop off with a guy like Shane Gossis Bear Jake Wallman like it's like who are you gonna throw out when it's uh a three-on-three overtime you don't really know right like no so I'm a little worried as well I think that um brings up the positive maybe area for improvement that the Buffalo Sabres have done in that division where maybe they end up taking a wild card spot who knows but their team that's been playing a little better as of recent yeah definitely they've been playing a little bit better but still I don't think they're going to be able to make too much of a jump in that division and it looks like they're probably going to miss out on the playoffs again this year and hopefully this isn't something where we look back on and they majestically win the Stanley Cup win the division somehow like uh, the St. Louis Blues are able to do that one year when they won the cup but it's been a struggle for them. The Red Wings, we're going to see if it becomes a struggle with injuries. But just to kind of touch up on this quickly, and I don't want to bring too much negative with the injuries that did happen, but I'm very surprised that it was only a six-game suspension for, I believe it was Zub that got the suspension. Or no, Zub got hit. Oh, Perron, right? Perron, Perron yeah, no. Yeah. So I'm thinking a little bit wrong. But 
Perron got a six-game suspension for his cross-check, I believe, on Zub in the head. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple plays that happened this game. I'm, I got it mixed up because if you watch the clip, you had Larkin lying down on the ground, but it was after the fact. And it was a crazy week of suspensions. We saw, how do you pronounce his name, Gabranson? Yeah. Gabranson okay. with a 26-minute penalty, and he only got a one-game suspension. I can't believe that. <sighs> yeah. It was ridiculous what he did. And I don't know what Cousins got. Do you? Dylan Cousins? No, uh, Nick Cousins. Oh, Nick Cousins. Uh, the hit on Gabranson. I think he just got the game misconduct. Yeah, misconduct, see, and that was it. I, I don't know because I think he got. I thought he got a two minute boarding penalty, and that's what happened. I, I'm I'm really confused as well. There's just been so many. I th- th- actually, you know what it was? It was initially a game misconduct. Then they reviewed it, and then they put it as a two minute minor. I'm pretty sure. Okay, yeah. And so. that's why he was able to still play in the game. Came out against Gabranson, then. I mean, just a terrible hockey play. Nick Cousins, I think, made a dump in, tries to get around Gabranson. He just grabs him and throws him to the ground. Like, there's no room for that in hockey, and I'm very surprised it was only a one-game suspension. Me too. Me too. I mean, to bring out the positive part for Cousins, although he kind of got that, um, got jumped by Gabranson there, it was actually 2-1 at that point. Uh, Gabranson took the penalty, and the Panthers ended up winning 4-1. So for Cousins there, um, although he didn't, you know, fight back, take a, take a penalty, Make it coincidentals. Um, it was good on him to not kind of let his anger out. Yeah, they got yeah. the win. They got the two points. Yep. They're smiling, That's but all that it, it like you said, there's not really room for that in hockey. You don't you don't like to see that and uh, someone wailing like that. But yeah, yeah, and because of that, now the Red Wings are missing some core players. And like we mentioned, Clem Costin before a piece that is de- a little bit deeper in the lineup. But for me, when he was playing on Edmonton before, like I mentioned last year, especially in the playoffs. He was a force to be reckoned with. Like, he's a good hockey player. And for the Edmonton Oilers, it looks like they don't miss him. Not even a little bit. It's it's weird to say, but they don't. They don't, and they've found uh, a way to get back on track um, after all the maybe negativity we've talked about about the Oilers on the pod, the pod so far. Yeah, a lot of negativity to start the season, and that kind of came from, I don't want to say an overreaction from us, but it kind of is a little bit alarming when – I mean, for me, the, I picked them to win the Stanley Cup prior to the start of the year, and out of nowhere, the coach is fired. Jack Campbell sent down to the minors. McDavid's hurt, and it's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Like, this is happening too fast. But it looks like after Woodcroft's gone, maybe they got a coach in that's kind of set up a new system for them. But McDavid looks like he's back. Goalie, goalies look like they're back. Stuart Skinner's playing pretty good, and Picard's kind of stepped into a role where he can, you know, just – I don't know, get them a 4-3 win. He's not going to get a yeah. shutout, really, I don't think. But, you know, a 4-3 win kind of close it in that last couple minutes. He's looked okay. Yeah, it's really interesting you mentioned Picard. I think you got to make sure that Stuart Skinner doesn't get burnt out. I think that's the question mark. With with Campbell still in the minors, um, I don't think you want Picard starting more than two games or three games in a month. Like, I, I don't think you want him playing too much. Um, the, Oilers, the Oilers have some big games coming up, so we're going to see... Um, if they can keep this up. One of those games is against the Lightning. I know that. Um, we'll see what happens. But at the end of the day, you can't hit a team who's, uh, who uh, is 7-0 and in their last seven. So Yeah, it's hard to hit a team that's 7-0. and And they're 7-3 and in their last 10 with McDavid having 23 points in the last nine games. Like, that's just ridiculous stuff from him. And it's been a while since we were able to say that because last year it was almost like we're, we were accustomed to this stuff, like almost three points a game. It's what it, – it's what like McDav- watching McDavid play in the playoffs, it's like, all right, yep, he picked up a goal and two apples. Like sounds like a Connor McDavid hockey game. And he's back to playing his game. The Oilers are back is what it seems like. And hopefully they could sustain, sustain this uh, success. Exactly, exactly. And honestly, there's not many guys in the league where you're going to um, see a three-point game from be a little like, okay, like – it's no worries. They got the win. He had three points. Um, it just shows how exceptional he is as a player. Oh, for sure. And uh, to wrap up today's podcast, we're going to do something a little bit fun, a little bit different from uh, what we usually do with Eric's picks. We're going to do our best players from nation- from each nationality. So sticking with that topic of the World Juniors and with com- that coming up, we're going to chat about some of uh, Canada's best players that have been playing in the NHL this season. So Eric, your first pick for Team Canada? Um, okay, Team Canada here. Let's get hyped for the World Juniors. Um, I'm going Nathan McKinnon. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, uh, even uh, even before last night, um, he had a great goal to make it 6-5, and they got the win. Uh, I'm going McKinnon there. And I'm going to go McDavid. as uh, 
he should be that number one center playing for Team Canada whenever they do decide to have that tournament. Like we just chatted about, 23 points in the last nine games. It looks like his goal-scoring form is back, but just his playmaking ability is... It's just ridiculous how good of a hockey player he is, and if he could just keep it up, I'm sure he'll score over 125 points without a doubt. Yeah, good call there. I think we'll move into the USA here. Yep, so for the USA... United States of America. Eric is picking a defenseman. Yep, I'm going with Quinn Hughes here. Um, I just I have to put respect on the Canucks' name. Whether or not they end up being that first seed, second seed, third seed, um, what Quinn Hughes has done is pretty exceptional. He's making the Hughes brothers as a whole look like a very good, like, yeah. brotherly name. Honestly, just putting a lot of respect on the Hughes <laughs> name. I think a lot of hockey fans who don't watch a ton of hockey are starting to hear the name Hughes and they're like, oh, there's there's brothers here. There's three guys. It makes it interesting, right? Makes it interesting. There's two on the Devils, one on the Canucks, but I got to go Quinn Hughes there. I think he's contributing to the success there in Vancouver. Yeah, talking about contributing to success, although Austin Matthews doesn't have the most points on his team, that's led by a player that we'll soon talk about. I'm going to have Austin Matthews as my most valuable player for Team USA and when you're scoring the most goals in the NHL, he's tied with Nikita Kucherov right now at 19. He just looks elite. And if you're an elite goal scorer in this league, you're going to get paid, you're going to win championships, and you're going to lead your team. And Matthews is just two things away from that. He's already got paid. Now he just needs to lead his team to a Stanley Cup final. And that's what I'm hoping for this year. And it looks like with the way that he's playing right now and how this team looks, I think it could happen. I'm not saying that's my pick. But at least for now, Matthews is my pick for the MVP of USA. All right, good call there. I mean, I think now we'll move on to uh, Sweden here. So I'm going to build off the Canucks talk. Uh, I just mentioned Quinn Hughes. I got to go with Elias Pettersson. I know I uh, moved him in fantasy hockey to you, Anthony, but um, Elias Pettersson's been great. Um, I think we talked about this in our first podcast, but he brings more than just the goal scoring, more than just the apples. He has a bit of a physical presence. He's not afraid to, to lay the body for a smaller build, but um, definitely going Pedersen there. I don't know if you agree or if you're going someone else. I mean, I agree he has been well. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to stay on that same topic. I'm going to pick Nylander. So like you pick Quinn and Pedersen, I'm going to pick Matthews and Nylander. So Nylander for Sweden has been my MVP this season, and I think he's going to be the best player going um, – for the rest of, I think, 60 games are left or 50 games. Yeah. I think he's going to sustain, you know, his goal scoring, his point getting. He just looks really good. And until he gets that contract, he's just going to keep working harder and harder. So, you know, although William Nylander hasn't had the best two, three-game stretch, you know, I think he's going to be able to come out with 100-plus points this season, no doubt. Wow, no doubt. That's a good take from you. I, I'm going to hold you to that and say if if, oh, if he no. does if he does not get 100 points, I'm going to uh, have to call you out for saying no doubt oh, no. there. Um, 100 points is nothing to be, like, playing around with. I mean, we talk about 40 goals and how everyone gets 40 goals nowadays, but, hey, 100 points, let, let's put some respect on that. All right, all right. I don't right. think Willie's ever hit that before. I think uh, – He's a good player with a lot of room for improvement. So, uh, I mean, I respect you for taking two Leafs. Maybe we'll have to talk about a Canucks Leafs uh, 2v2 battle one day, see what's happening there. But um, I think it leads us to uh, into our last country we're going to be discussing, which is Finland. So who's been the best Finnish player this year? The best Finnish player, and I hope you can agree with me because I think it's just a matter of time, but Mikko Rantanen, although there are some good Finnish players that can make up a good roster, I think Mikko Rantanen, without a doubt, is just by far any competitor in his uh, country. And for me, playing for the Colorado Avalanche, he's already won a cup. He's playing well this season. No doubt he's my MVP for Finland. All right, I'm going to agree with you. We haven't agreed too much on this podcast, but I'm going to agree with you there, Mikko Rantanen. Um, it makes my picks a little easier. I got Rantanen, McKinnon, um, Patterson Hughes, two guys from the Avs, two guys from the Canucks. And then for you, you got Rantanen. Nylander, Matthews, and McDavid. Um, definitely similar picks. All these guys have done well in terms of points this year. Um, but yeah. Yeah, definitely a lot of similar success and something to look forward to as we watch the rest of the season. But <clears throat> something I might blindside you with quickly before we end this podcast. I want to know, Eric, going into the Christmas break, what is the biggest thing that you're looking forward to? It could be food. It could be presents. It could be looking at Christmas lights. It could be working. What is it? Honestly, for me... This is, I mean, we're in Canada here. A lot of people watching this might be a different, but I'm looking forward to snow. I haven't seen much snow at all. I'm looking forward to the cold weather. I want to see outdoor rinks. I want to see uh, skating. I want to see, like, it snowing on Christmas Eve. Like, I, I literally just want some snow in the next few weeks. Um, 
and I think that's just gonna make for a good Christmas throwing the snowballs a little having Definitely. some fun um what do you think I mean I I agree with you and you kind of took the words out of my mouth. I'm looking forward to snow as well, but in a way that I'm looking for, I'm look for, looking forward to the rinks and just kind of going out there. Finally, I was able to get or find an old pair of blades in my basement, so I'll be able to swap those out so I don't need to constantly get um, my skate sharpened whenever we play because we already know that when you go out to the pond, the, your blades just get yeah, ruined. they're done. They're done. But, I mean, we did, what was that, a year ago, two years ago, we went out to the pond here at Brock, and that oh, yeah. was so much fun. So just doing that, listening to some music, chilling with the boys, some hot chocolate, that should be a lot of fun. But should be a good Christmas break. We uh, are undecided if we're going to be able to get the podcast going next week, but we'll definitely post something on our Instagram if uh, we do that. Yeah, we're on the road to 10 podcasts. So um, have a listen, guys. We're on Spotify, Apple Music, sorry, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, TikTok, uh, you name it. So uh, give us a shout, have a listen, and uh, subscribe. Thank you. Cheers, everyone, and uh, we'll see you after the holidays.